Yes, my talk is on male and female um, infertility. Not quite sure why they named it that. Uh, not female and female infertility, not male and male infertility, male and female infertility. I, I did um, ask a friend of mine um, whether there are, what do they call, gays, whether they are homosexuals in China. So he said, no, there's no homosexual, no gays in China. We sent them all to Australia. <laughs> so we're going to talk about male and female infertility. So we have got two topics. Uh, one is uh, two on uh, male infertility. One is um, basically, the first one is basically talking about um, how long we should culture a teaser, which is surgically retrieved sperm, to try and improve the motility. The second uh, talk is about a, instead of using the usual parameters or SEMA analysis, which is count, motility, and morphology, is there a sperm function test that you can use to better predict uh, pregnancies from IUI and natural uh, intercourse? And finally, on female infertility, um, this is, this is a very good study. This is a randomized control trial, whether you should use progesterone uh, in letrozole um, ovulation induction in PCO women. Mohammed, <laughs> next slide. Okay, start with the mail. Uh, this is an oral presentation by Carol Lawrence. Uh, she's from Canada. And it talks about, it's entitled, Improvement of Sperm Motility in Surgically Retrieved Testicular Sperm Samples with In Vitro Culture. So we all know about when you surgically retrieve sperm, uh, put a needle uh, and retrieve the sperm, the sperm is not as good as if you ejaculated the sperm. The main issue is with motility. We also know that if you wait a while, sometimes when you get the sperm and the scientists say it's not moving, but if you wait a while, you'll find that the motility improves. So this, the question is, can you actually wait longer? And how long can you wait um, to try and improve this motility? So that's what um, this um, uh, Carol Lawrence was trying to uh, prove. Uh, her aim of this study was to verify the effect of incubation times and overnight, so 24 hours overnight incubation of teaser, the testicular uh, sperm retrieves uh, sperm on sperm motility. So it's very, very specific though. I'm happy to take questions after this, but this is a very specific study only looking at that aspect of things, sperm motility, surgically retrieve sperm, and when we look at how she's done the study, it's on a very uh, select group of patients. It is on, um, yeah, got it. Okay, it is on obstructive azoospermia patients. So I want to emphasize this. So don't go away and think that this study is on non-obstructive. So these are obstructive azoospermic patients, patients that had vasectomy, failed vasectomy reversals, patients that had maybe chlamydia, gonorrhea, causing blockage. So obstructive azoospermia. And what they did was 20 patients. They took the samples, testicular retrieve samples, um, minced it, there's all the description of how they minced it, also description of how they incubated it. And basically, they looked at, at point zero, zero hours, and then four hours later, they compared the motility. Zero hours is defined as after they've prepared the sperm. They got not the time that they retrieved the sperm, after they've prepared the sperm, which they've described, finely minced in gamete buffer, cooked Sydney IVF, and that's zero hours. And then they look at motility four hours later. Then they also look at four hours versus 24 hours later. So this is 20 patients. They use the um, correct logistic uh, studies, linear regression model, Magnimus test is because it's a non-parametric test. So they use that to, to see whether it's statistically different in terms of the motility. So this is the results um, presented in a diagrammatic form. So this is 
at zero hours, and this is at four hours. This is motility, 5%, 10%, 5%, 10%, 10%. So if it was exactly the same motility at zero hours and at, uh, at, at four hours, the graph would go 5%, 10%, 10%, it will be exactly 45 degrees. There's no difference at zero and 45 hours. The fact that it's slanted, slanted down this way, means that um, after four hours, the motility has increased. And then again, based on the same principle, four hours versus 24 hours, you note that the slant has come down even more. So there is even more, a higher percentage of more tau sperm, the longer you incubate. So that is what she has shown, and it's done by the correct um, statistical analysis, and it's shown to be statistically significant. This is, um, what, this is an implication of what this means. It means for a particular patient, initially, because of the lowish low motility, they could only freeze. This is one patient after 24 hours incubation, zero hours, if they had frozen the sperm at that time, they would freeze three straws. But if they had waited 24 hours, they would have increased the number to five straws. So that is the implication of this study. Conclusion. Next slide. that if you incubate, this is a very straightforward conclusion, that you incubate the sperm from zero to four hours, and from four to 24 hours, you're going to get a higher percentage of motile sperm. And this is important from a clinical implication, not we've just shown you that you can have actual increased number of straws if you're going to freeze it. But it also means that the timing of oocyte retrieval can be varied because we can't afford to wait. For example, that you can actually do the teaser one day before the egg collection because you can incubate the sperm overnight. So there's no rush to try and time the, the, the teaser with, with the egg collections. Okay, that's the end. Second talk is on a, a novel essay in biomarkers. It's by Palermo. I don't know whether you This is, uh, he's now based in uh, New York. So it is a bioassay to measure, it's a poster presentation, bioassay to measure fertilization competence of human uh, spermatozoa. Background is that if you were you know, assessing a infertile couple and you were looking at the man's side, the usual case is to do a semen analysis. And semen analysis, what you get is the count, the motility, and the morphology. What you don't get is whether the sperm has a functional capacity, so we don't have a functional test to check whether the sperm has the capacity to fertilize the eggs. And especially what Palermo is doing in this study is talking about the capacitation. So capacitation is when the sperm achieves maturation uh, as it goes through the female genital tract. And he's saying that there is an essay now that he can actually use to test for capacitation. So the aim of the study is to test a biomarker-based essay to diagnose sperm function, and which specifically predicts the ability of sperm to capacitate and fertilize. Next slide. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I will try this. I've um, looked at Google and found out what gangliocyte GM1 is. It's a molecule found in lots of cells in the body, but specifically, he's looking at this molecule, gangliocyte GM1, in the sperm. And he's saying that based on where the molecule is in the sperm, the localization of that molecule, okay, with a fluorescent microscopy, he can tell whether this sperm has or has not got the capacitation capacity. So he shows it in the graph. Next slide. Again, um, this is, I don't think you need to really understand this. All you need to know is that based on his normal reference, he can tell whether a sperm passes or fails this assay. And it's interesting because he, he, 
this study has um, 63 patients. And out of the 63 patients whose sperm, based on WHO 2010 criteria, was suitable for um, natural conception or IUI, half of them, more than half of them, failed this essay. And what's the implications of that in terms of results? Out of the 63, 31 passed the essay. That means has the capacitation ability. 32 failed it. And whether it be IUI or natural pregnancy, the pregnancy rates in the group that passed it is 55% versus in the group that failed it is 6%. And that is statistically significant. Don't even need to do a statistical test, you just eyeball it. So he's saying that based on that, the current algorithm of how you treat patients is you do the traditional semen analysis, and if it has got enough sperm, motile, normal forms, then you will try IUI. So pass, you try IUI. And the patient doesn't get pregnant, maybe you do it another time, two or three times. If eventually, after two or three times, he or she, uh, she does not get pregnant, then you figure out, okay, maybe there is a sperm function problem, okay? Let's move on to IVF or even straight to XC. So he's proposing that with his new test, you don't need to go through that problem, that, that trouble. You do your normal semen analysis, they pass it, then you do this capacitation test. And if they pass the essay, you can go down the IUI path. But if they fail it, even though the semen analysis is within normal limits, one should consider going straight to, now he did not say ICSI, but no, that is the implication, that there is a problem with the sperm, sperm fertilization, functional sperm uh, fertilization capacity. So this saves the couple of you know, doing I unnecessary IUIs. But it is still new, it is still new, he still has a long way to go before this test is offered as, a, as a, a laboratory test for all of us. Conclusion is that sperm capacity was reflected in the pattern of the GM1 localization. That localization needs more study into it. But that, importantly, once you get the essay right, and if the patient fails that essay, despite having normal parameters on WHO criteria, the, the pregnancy rate is very low. So we're talking about 55 versus 6%. So we should consider the in, in, implications that once we get this sorted out, that we should consider moving these sort of patients directly to um, IVF stroke XC. Last study, females. Last study of the day. It's always very hard to give the last talk of the day. Everyone is... Uh, about to fall, to fall asleep, including myself. <laughs> okay, last one. This is a poster presentation. Um, it is actually my, my favorite study of all the studies that I've presented, or besides my, my, uh, my own clinical fellow, um, Prakashi. Why? Because it is a randomized control trial. We've, we very seldom see randomized control trials. Poster presentation looking at luteal phase supplementation with vaginal progesterones in women with polycystic ovary syndrome and ovulatory dysfunction undergoing ovulatory induction with letrozole, ARCT. So Prakashi is from USA, and, and it's such a lovely study. PCO women, ovulatory inf um, infertility using letrozole. So he's saying that these patients are often supplemented. I, I beg to differ because I don't use progesterones uh, if I was doing Clomid or letrozole. Um, but he's asking the question, if we gave these patients uh, PCO, ovulatory uh, dysfunction, if we gave them letrozole um, and we randomized them to um, uh, progesterone suppository or not, will we change the pregnancy rate? The aim is to determine if there's a benefit to the use of vaginal progesterone. In this case, he's using 8% crinone in women with PCOS and ovulatory dysfunction undergoing ovulation induction with letrozole. So the way he's done the study, um, it is an ongoing trial. So he's done all the right things. If you look... Um, 
If you look later on, he's done all the power, power calculations. It's an ongoing RCT, and he's reporting an interim result. RCT, um, women that less than 40 years old met the criteria, started on letrozole, and between 2012 and ongoing, right up to ASRM. And it will finish it in uh, probably um, next year. The women were randomized one to one, so either they got vaginal pessaries or not. Um, three days, so we started three days after HCG trigger. Once they re, uh, reach HCG trigger criteria, randomized, and then they started three days later. But this is IUI or time intercourse, depending on their semen par parameters. So you've got to look at all these uh, details. These are patients going through IUI and, and all time intercourse. So this is an interim analysis, hasn't really finished. This is what I was talking about. He's done the power calculations. So the power calculations, if you look at this part, um, to show that there will be a 16% pregnancy rate per cycle, a difference in, in, in pregnancy rate of 16%, he needs 51 in each arm, 51 patients in each arm. The usual um, alpha equals 0 0.05, beta equals 0 0.20. So he needs... Uh, 51 cycles to prove that. He hasn't actually reached that number. He's got 62. So 51 in each arm is 102. He's got a total of 62 completed pre, uh, pre cycles. But why is he reporting it? He's reporting it because there is already a statistically significant difference in the treated group. So if you gave Crinon, in this case, Crinon 8%, three days after a HCG, you will find that your pregnancy rate is 21.4 versus 6.1%. And that's not even having to complete the numbers. He's already showing such a big difference. So because this is an RCT by right, all the confounding factors should be randomized to both groups. Um, he looked at it, and there is no significant difference except the most important confounding factor, which is age. Age, there is a difference. But lo and behold, in the treated group with the higher pregnancy rate is actually the older patients. So that, that to me, is that's even more supportive of what he's trying to say. Conclusions, interim uh, analysis suggests that uh, vaginal progesterones uh, in women with PCO ovulatory dysfunction undergoing OI and OI is um, intercourse um, uh, or IUI with letrozole in the luteal phase demonstrates a trend towards higher pregnancy rates. So he has to complete the study um, before it will be published, but at this point in time, you know, this is almost convincing enough for me to start patients on that. Thank you very much. Oh, I've got a summary. Uh, okay. Do we need to summarize? Okay, let's summarize, sorry. Can't go. Lawrence um, shows that the longer you keep the sperm, that's Lawrence coming up, <laughs> shows the longer you keep the sperm after surgical sperm retrieval, you're going to get more motility. So that's two implications to that. That means you don't need to time the egg collection so ac accurately, and, and meaning that you, know, you should really consider incubating for 24 hours because you're going to get more sperm uh, that, that are usable and even to freeze. Second study, uh, Palermo, um, showing that um, this, the current semen, semen parameters is not good enough uh, to predict IUI um, or uh, natural intercourse. That there should be another sperm function test to test capacitation, and this will improve pregnancy rates. And finally, finally, last slide. Prakashi's uh, randomized control trial saying that um, if you use vaginal pessaries after um, the HCG trigger in patients going through OI, IUI with uh, letrozole, you're going to get a statistically an impressive uh, increase in pregnancy rate. Now, that's it. Thank you very much.